Good morning, everybody. It's so good to see you in the house of the Lord today. If you're online, we're so thankful that you're worshiping with us this morning at the Longview Heights Seventh-day Adventist Church right here in Memphis, Tennessee. We're thankful because we know God is keeping us alive. God is watching over us. God is our refuge and our strength. And we're thankful that regardless of what we go through, he's always there by our side. I'm glad to see each one of you, and I hope that you enjoy worshiping with us today. We had a wonderful Sabbath last Sabbath as we had communion. And communion is always a good thing because it, it draws us closer to God. The ordinance of humility lets us realize that we're all the same. We're all one in Christ Jesus. And Jesus is willing to forgive us of our sins. I want to thank the deaconess for the bread and the wine. We hadn't had real bread and wine in a while. And so I want to thank them for the bread and the wine that we had on this past Sabbath. Next Sabbath is going to be our Youth Sabbath. We hope that you will come and invite people for our Youth Sabbath program. We have a guest speaker. Uh, he's preached here before, Pastor Darian Baker. You will really enjoy him as he speaks the word on next Sabbath. Today we have a full day for you. We have a message this morning, this Sabbath day, this worship service where we'll lift up the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. That's, that's what we plan to do. Lift his name up and all the world can be drawn to him. After our worship service, we're going right into our Sabbath school where we get to study the word of God and learn more of how God wants us to live as we study the book of Psalms. I want you to remember Memphis Adventist Academy. You have some young people that need to have a place to go, a place of where they can learn more about Jesus Christ, learn also academically. That is a school that you want to be involved in. You can just go online and look up Memphis Adventist Academy. Today, right after Sabbath school, we're having a fellowship dinner. That means you're invited to eat together with us today. Come on and say amen. We're going to have some dinner for you this Sabbath. We want you to remember that and come and stay for the dinner. And right after the dinner, we're having Adventist Youth Ministries where you will really enjoy a wonderful program for Adventist youth. Then later on this evening, we have gym night at the Memphis Adventist Academy. We hope that you can be there. Now on Wednesday, Wednesday we have our prayer meeting. It's online. It's on Zoom. I've been enjoying as our elders have been sharing the word of God with us night after night. We start at 6.30 on our Zoom line where we spend time in prayer. And after we spend time in prayer for about 30 minutes, then we go into the study of the word. So I hope that you can join us at prayer meeting on this Wednesday night. Good to see each person here today. We're going to continue our worship service as we start in praising God and, and talking to God and, and listening to his voice. It's good to be able to talk to God, isn't it? He has, a, he, he has a wonderful way of communicating with us through the Bible and through prayer and through nature as well. So I'm glad you're here today, and I pray that God will continually bless you as we worship the Lord today in spirit and in truth. David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I know you're glad to be here today, and the Holy Spirit is here to welcome you and to serve you today. It is our privilege whenever we come before the Lord, our Maker, to pray to him. And this is a sweet hour of prayer. Let us come before the Lord, our Maker. Let us kneel before him as we pray. Oh God, our help in ages past. You've been our hope for years to come. You've been our shelter from the stormy blast, and you are our eternal home. Oh, Father, we, we are assembled before you now because it is your holy Sabbath. This is the day you set aside for your children to come and worship. We're here to worship today, Lord. We're here to worship the almighty God, the sovereign God, 
you God all by yourself. Lord, we're here because we need you. You don't need us. You're worthy even though we are unworthy. Oh Lord, you've been good to us in the past because in your mighty power, in your creative power, you still love us. A sick insignificant human being, sinful human being, standing before a holy God, Lord, we know now that you are worthy to be praised. So we give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. Oh, Lord, we ask that as we worship today, that you accept our worship, accept our praise, accept our singing, O oh Lord, accept our, our, our offerings. We come before you, Lord, with all kinds of needs. Sometimes we don't even know what we need. We don't even know what to pray for. But because you love us and because your Holy Spirit discerns our innermost needs, we know you do for us that which we need and that which you alone can do for us. Oh, Lord, if anybody came here with a burden, lift that burden, Father. If anybody came here looking for healing, you say you are our healer, and that you heal us of all of our hurts and our, our ailments. Come, dear Lord, and hear the prayers of, of all of us who need healing. Some of us are grieving today, Lord, Comfort us. Oh, Lord, whatever our needs are, we know you are able and you are willing. And so we want to thank you for hearing and answering our prayer as we come before you with our supplication. We ask him for prayers for our church, Lord. Bless this church that you have planted in this corner in Memphis. Bless us. Give us the Holy Spirit. Give us the power that we need to be able to witness for you. Empower the officers of this church so we can minister to the needs of this community. We are praying, dear Lord, that this church will be that beacon light on top of the hill that invites the wandering soul to a, a, a place of refuge. Come, dear Lord and fill this place with your power, with your presence, with your Holy Spirit. Bless the word as of your word as your man servant breaks the bread of life to us. Prepare our hearts and our minds to receive your word. May it be, be may it fill our souls. May it be imprinted on our minds and, 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 and on our hearts. Give us an obedient spirit, Lord, Lord so when you speak, that we will follow. Come, dear Lord, and accept us and accept our worship in the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
why don't you do like the song says, praise him. Yeah. Exalt his holy name. Is he worthy to be praised? Yeah. Amen. Y'all too quiet for me. Is he worthy to be praised? Yeah. Amen. 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 The song says there is a name I love to hear. I love to sing his word. We want you all to join in with us. It's hymn 248, but it should be on the screen. The song says, oh, how I love Jesus. How many of you love Jesus? How many of you really love Jesus? Let's stand together and sing. Come on now, you need to really sing like you love him. We need to hear some altos out there, and some tenors, and some baritones and bass. Come on, let's sing right here. There is. Sing his word. It sounds like music. The sweetest name. Come on, lift your voice. Oh, oh, I love Jesus. Singing, oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because, verse two, second verse. Who died? Who died me it tells me of the, the sinner's perfect plea. Come on, church, you can do better than that. Sing, oh, oh, that's it, that's it. Singing, oh. Verse 3. Watch this. We're going to add a verse. We're going to add a verse. We're going to add a verse. Amazing grace. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that said like me. I was, was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now. Come on, lift your voices. Tennis, I hear altos. Oh, how I love Jesus. Well, musicians, you already know. You already know we got a key change coming right here. Oh, y'all sit here, tennis. Sister Young got one more key change in her. She got one more key change in her. Oh, how I love Jesus. Singing, oh, how I love Jesus. One more time in that same key. One more time in that same key. One more time for good measure. Oh, oh.
Revelation 21 and 4, I think it is. Somebody can fact check it. But it says that uh, God will wipe away tears from our eyes, every tear from our eyes. I think, that, I think that's what it is. Gail wrote this song uh, some time ago, and we're just now getting around to singing it, but it's a very uh, insightful song, simple song, but insightful. Talks about how God is going to wipe, and I did a little reading about it, Sister Sandra, and theologians and commentators uh, have different viewpoints on that scripture because it talks about God wiping away tears and uh, he said, well, are we going to have tears in heaven? Heaven's going to be a place of joy. So where are the tears coming from? I did some more additional reading, Dr. Fosier, and psychologists and scientists are still trying to understand why humans shed tears. Humans are the only mammals that shed tears because of emotion. And they generally think that it's because when humans are placed in situations either of extreme happiness or joy or fear, that it just evokes certain emotions, but they still don't understand why water comes out of the eyes. Still studying that. But whatever the source of tears are, either tears of happiness, I know when I get to heaven, I, I might share some tears too, but I think it's going to be some shouting tears and some hallelujah tears. I wish I had some help in here. <laughs> but nevertheless, the song says, God will wipe away every tear. So it might be some tears of sadness for maybe loved ones that didn't make it or whatever. We don't know. But the song says, God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. So we're going to try a new one on you today. Y'all say amen. amen. Beautiful song written by Gail Jones Murphy says, God will wipe away every tear. And the word should be on the screen, so follow along with us.
Amen. I, I don't know, but I just start thinking about that. Won't that be a great day? When every tear, I don't know about you, but I've had a lot of tears that loved ones are friends, and God's going to wipe those tears away. Won't you, don't you want to be there when God wipes every tear from our eyes? Thank you so much, choir, for sharing that testimony, something that we can look forward to. I don't know about you, but I look forward to the day when God wipes every tear from our eyes. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Will you bow your heads with me as we seek the Lord in prayer today? Father, we children in heaven, speak through your word again. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Please turn your Bibles to the book of St. John, chapter 5, and verse 39. St. John, the fifth chapter, and verse 39. St. John 5, verse 39. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. But they are they which testify of me. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. But they are they which testify of me. The Jewish community that Jesus was talking to did not have the internet. They did not have the luxury of Grammarly. They did not have all the different uh, websites that we have today. In fact, they did not have AI. You've heard of AI, haven't you? AI is extending the capacity of machines so that they can do what humans actually do. In fact, they have actually machines that look like you, that can talk like you. Well, the, the Jewish community didn't have those things. What they had was the scripture, and they would study the scripture consistently. The Jews, the Jews searched the scriptures hoping to find eternal life in the scriptures. They felt by looking at the Old Testament, because that's the only scripture that they had, from Genesis all the way to Malachi, they studied these scriptures and they memorized them. Some rabbis had memorized all of the Old Testament. They knew this for themselves. It was in their mind. They had a theoretical knowledge of the scriptures. In fact, they believed that you would receive life, our eternal life, just by knowing the scriptures. They felt that they could, that, that was their AI. That was their way of saying, this is what I can do because of my own abilities, I can learn the scriptures enough so I can have eternal life through the scriptures. Jesus in introduced them to another AI. Not to artificial intelligence, but to authentic intelligence. He said, the scriptures that you read are really about me. The scriptures that you read are not just about Moses and about David and about Elijah, but the scriptures, they all actually point to me. Every scripture is about Jesus. In the book of Acts, chapter 10, verse 43, I don't have time to turn to it, but it says that all the prophets talked about Jesus. Everything in the Old Testament was leading to Jesus. When Moses took the children out of the land of Egypt, the cloud that covered them uh, in, the, in, the, in the daytime was a cloud that represented Jesus. The, the, the fire represented Jesus that covered them and warmed them at night. Every lamb that they sacrificed represented Jesus. He is the authentic intelligence. Uh, so throughout the Old Testament, he was the son of David, the son of man, and the son of God. All of this is because he wanted them to know that the old, all the scriptures point to Jesus. He's not only the good shepherd, but he's also the lamb. Yeah, he's the stone, and 
yet at the same time, he's the bread. He's the water of life, and, and he's the alpha, and he's the omega, and he's the beginning, and he's the end. He's the first, and he's the last. In fact, the Bible says that, that, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Uh, he's the authentic intelligence. Well, shortly, just for a few, few minutes today, I want to show you in the Old and New Testament how authentic he is. I can't do it all because it's too much. I'd have to go through every scripture, all the different books, but, but I'm just going to take a few in, in, in a topical understanding of how Jesus is in the whole Bible. First of all, I'd like to say that Jesus is the, has a messianic message in the Old Testament. Messianic means it points towards the Messiah. Are y'all following me? And in the Bible, in the Old Testament, Everything in the Old Testament was pointing towards a deliverer, a Messiah, a Christ. And so every lamb that they killed and, and, and offered that lamb, that lamb pointed towards the Messiah. And in the Old Testament, it talks about the Messiah, of how Jesus would come to this earth. In the book of, of Isaiah, what book did I say, everybody? I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. Isaiah, one of the messianic prophecies uh, of, about Jesus. Isaiah chapter 7, and let's look at verse 14. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a what, everybody? Behold, the virgin shall what? Conceive and what? And shall call his name what? And Emmanuel means what? God with us. The virgin shall conceive. God was telling them that God is going to use a virgin to bear a son. And that's not possible. A virgin, usually, uh, when you think of a virgin, a person that has not had a sexual relationship, and the only way that we know of a person being able to have a child is if they have a sexual relationship. Am I right about it? But God was into in vitro fertilization before man knew anything about it. Oh, y'all not listening to me today. God was able to put inside of a woman. Uh, he was able to put an embryo in a virgin and make a baby without having any man to have anything to do with it. He goes beyond what we can think. Even today, we, use, we least, at least need a man for the sperm. But God says, I'll do it myself. Uh, I'm going to put in a virgin, a, a, a woman, I'm going to put in her, and I'm going to give her a baby, and I'm going to do it, and it's going to be the Son of God. God didn't only put the baby in it, but he put his son in her. I know it's just too, too far for us to fathom. It, it, it's immaculate. <laughs> it goes beyond our thinking. But what God is saying, I have my own way of bringing a baby into this earth. And nobody else can do it like him. And so in, in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, I don't have time to turn to it, but it says, and the fullness of time, Jesus was born, God was born of a woman under the law. Jesus came at the right time because he was prophesied that he would come on the earth. He was put in a woman, and that woman had a baby. You know what? I, that's what I like about God. He will use anybody. Sometimes we don't like to use women. Help me, Holy Ghost. Sometimes we try to put women down. Oh, I know I'm telling the truth. Amen, Pastor Horton. I have to say it myself. Sometimes we act like women are second-class citizens, but God uses a woman to give Jesus to the If it wasn't for Mary, we wouldn't have Jesus. Amen. And the Messiah, the Messianic prophecy, came through a woman, and God loves everybody. He doesn't just love men. He loves women, too. I have to make that clear because there are some people that think that God loves somebody better than somebody else. They feel like they should, men should be paid more than women. Oh, y'all not listening to me today. 
Uh, for the longest in our own country, women could not vote because men, women were looked at as lower than men. But I want you to know that God looks at all of us as equal. Hallelujah. Uh, that, that's the messianic, the messianic message. But then God also showed, Jesus showed himself in a theophany. A theophany is a theological term that simply means that Jesus shows up physically before he came as a baby in Bethlehem. See, because Jesus is the everlasting father. He pre-existed. He existed before he was a baby in Bethlehem. I know it, it, it's mind-boggling, but this is what the Bible says. He, he has these theophanies, these times where he came into the world and he showed up as a human, as a man, and people noticed him. What are you talking about, Pastor Horton? Can we go to the Bible? I'm going to show it to you from the Word of God. Would you turn to the book of Daniel? What book did I say, everybody? Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. And let's look at verse 23 through 25. Daniel chapter 3. You know this story. Daniel chapter 3, starting with verse 23. And these three men, Shachrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound. Everybody say bound. Bound in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. The king Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and he rose in haste and spoke saying to his counselors, did not we cast three men bound, everybody say bound, bound in the midst of the fire. They answered and said to the king, true, O king, look, he said, he answered, I see four men, what? Loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is what? Do you see the theophany? God showed up in a fiery furnace, and when he showed up, the people that were bound all of a sudden were loose. Oh, y'all miss y'all shouting for it right there. But God says, I, will, I don't have to wait till I become a baby in Bethlehem. I don't have to wait till, till, I, till I die on the cross. I don't have to wait to rise from the grave. I can do work even before then. In the Old Testament, God shows a theophany where he does stuff even before he was born. Hallelujah. That's what I like about God. He is not, he is not limited by our limitations. He is not controlled by our time schedule. He doesn't follow our logic. He doesn't need our science. He's God all by himself. And if he wants to show up before he's born, he can do it. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> you can't do it, but he can do it. Somebody said, my God can do anything. Am I right about it? He showed up, and he showed up when they were in trouble. That's what I like about God. He doesn't just show up when everything is going okay. But he waited till they got in the fiery furnace. You know what? Sometimes you think that God is not near you, but before you get into the fiery furnace, he's already there. <laughs> he's already, you know what? When they put him in the fiery furnace, he was in the furnace before they were in the furnace. Uh, maybe you got some furnaces that you've been in. Uh, are you getting ready to go in? I want you to know today that the God we serve is already in the furnace. And not only that, if you're handcuffed, if you're bound, uh, he's already going to loose you before you even get in the furnace. Somebody's going to look in the furnace and say, didn't we just throw three people? And who is the fourth one? He looks like the son of God because God is a theophany. He, he, he shows himself. He expresses himself. He exposes himself even before he comes as a baby in Bethlehem. I'm talking about Jesus in the scriptures today. He is, you talk about AI. He is the authentic intelligence. <laughs> He's the, and, and, and we can find that also in the New. I, I like the Old and the New Testament. See, the Old Testament is the New Testament 
concealed. And the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. I heard somebody say that. I thought that was pretty good. All right. Well, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. There's so much in the Old Testament that points toward the New Testament. And then the New Testament is always quoting the Old Testament. It's always, they're always saying something from the Old Testament because uh, they, didn't, they didn't have any problem of, of quoting and not even giving the license of where it came from because it was the Word of God. In the book of Mark chapter 2 and verse 15, Mark chapter 2, notice how Jesus continues to show up with people, how he continually shows up with sinners. He always comes our way. He's not so holy that he doesn't spend time with us. In Mark chapter 2, verse 15, the Bible says these words, 15 and 16. Now it happened as he was dining in Levi's house that many tax collectors, let me stop right there, Tax collectors were, were looked at as being evil because they stole from the people. Are y'all listening to me today? They didn't, Jews did not like tax collectors because the tax collectors worked for Rome and the tax collectors were not paid by Rome. They would get a little extra money and cheat you out of the money that you were supposed to give and they'd keep a little bit, and they were Jews. They were Jews. They were people that turned on their own people. And so they were looked at as sinners in Mark chapter 2, verse 15. Now it happened as he was dining in Levi's house. And many tax collectors and sinners, that takes care of everybody else, doesn't it? And you, you, you can say you were there. Is anybody listening to me today? You, know, you, you were there. And, um, I was there. Many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they what? Isn't it interesting that Jesus comes around sinners? Is anybody thankful today that Jesus eats with sinners? There are some people you may not spend time with, but Jesus spends time with the sinners. Notice what the, the, the Pharisees said in verse 16. And when the scribes and the Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, now how is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? I like this text. See, Jesus, he didn't only show up in the Old Testament with sinners, but he shows up in the New Testament with sinners today. He hangs around people that are messed up. Am I right about it? He'll even hang, he'll even hang around some church members. <laughs> he, he'll, even, he'll even come around some Pharisees. And, and some, Jesus is not so bougie that he won't spend time with people that are dirty, people that have bad attitudes, people that are filled with pride, people that have addictions. He goes around these people, and the Bible says he was eating with them. In other words, he had a relationship with them. He was trying to work with them. He wasn't just meeting with them just so, so that he could do the things that they were doing, but he was saying, I'm going to meet with you because I'm going to show you a better way. I'm going to live in such a way that you can see a, a, a new life in my life and you'll decide to follow me. Those Pharisees were not happy that Jesus was with sinners when they didn't understand that they needed to be there too. Because <laughs> all of us are sinners. Am I right about it? All of us are sinners, and we need the grace of God. But these tax collectors and these sinners, what I like about it, they wanted to be with Jesus. Whether you know it or not, Jesus does not just show up at church. Jesus is in the hood. Jesus is in the jail. Jesus is down there at 401, 201 Poplar. Am I right about it? 
Jesus will go into the place where, where people are taking their clothes off and dancing. People will say, oh, Holy Spirit won't go. Why wouldn't he go? Somebody needs him in there. Jesus will go where people are putting drugs in their veins, where people are putting drugs in their nose. Jesus goes where sinners are. Because he's trying to, Jesus is trying to tell us something. We need to reach people where they are. Don't expect everybody just to come into these hallowed halls and say, oh, I want to follow Jesus. You got to go where they are. Now you got to be careful. I said, you got to be careful. If you know you used to drink, maybe you shouldn't visit the bar. Is, is anybody listening to me today? If you know you got some temptations, then you might not go to that particular place. Go to some other place. <laughs> there's, enough sinners for, <laughs> there's enough sinners for everybody. You can find them anywhere you want to in Memphis. They're all over the place. The Bible says there were many of them. And there's still many. The problem is too many church members are so holy that we don't mingle with sinners. We go to our jobs with them and we just, we don't say too much to them because they're sinners. Because <laughs> they're sinners. We don't have a relationship with them. And we want them to follow Christ, but we never show them love. Amen. I know I'm telling the truth. Our job is not just to be a holy Christian. Our job is to witness to people that are not Christians. Let me just stay there just for a second. All Christians don't keep the Sabbath holy. There are some Christians that worship on Sunday. I said they're Christians. Are you listening to me today? Just because they don't follow everything that we follow doesn't mean that they're not Christians. In fact, we don't have the right to judge who's Christians and who's not. Am I right about it? You look around and just say, I don't know you. Turn that into your name. I don't, I don't know who you are. They may be a Christian or they may not be. But one person that you ought to know is yourself. Amen. There are many people that have never heard the name of Jesus and they're going to be saved. Because God judges them by what they know and not what they don't know. Amen. I, one of the most painful things that happened in my life as a young minister was I was called to the hospital and a young family had lost their baby. And they, they came to me practically running with tears in their eyes. They said, why? Why did God let this happen? Why did God let this happen? They wanted some answers from me, but I didn't have any answers. Because sometimes God allows sin to have its way in our life. Am I right about it? Could God stop it? Could God stop it? Could God stop people from dying? Could God stop crime? Could God stop all the cancer in the world? Could he stop? Does he already have a cure? God could do it, but for whatever reason, he doesn't do it. And we have to trust God even when bad things happen. We can't, we can't expect God to always work it out. Sometimes you will not be delivered. Sometimes a Christian will lay down their head and they'll die. And it doesn't mean that God doesn't love them. It's that we live in a sinful world. And sometimes sin will have its effect upon us. And yet God still hangs around sinners like you and me. The, disciple, the, the Pharisee said, why does God hang around tax collectors? Why does Jesus hang around? Because the, the heal don't need a physician. It is the sick. Is there anybody sick out there? Does anybody know that without the grace of God, they could not make it? Does anybody know I need thee every hour? I'm preaching myself today. You don't have to say hallelujah. I'll say it. I need him in the morning, in the afternoon, and in the evening. I need him all the time because I realize I'm only saved by grace. Amen.
That's the theophany. I get kind of excited about that one. Then, then there's the disposition Jesus. You know, in, in, in the courts, sometimes you might not be able to make it to court. Maybe you're sick. Maybe you're out of the country. And you can send a disposition. You can send an affidavit. It is a paper where you write down your testimony or your witness. And Jesus is seen in the Old Testament with a disposition. Will you turn with me to the book of Zechariah? What book did I say, everybody? Zechariah. Let's turn to Zechariah. It's, it's one of those minor prophets way back there in the back. It's Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah. Zechariah, chapter 4 and verse 6. Zechariah, chapter 4 and verse 6. So he answered and said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. He wasn't there, but he sent a letter. He, he sent a message. He had an affidavit sent to him. He said, I'm going to give you some information, and although I'm not physically here, I want you to hear the word of the Lord. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit says the Lord of hosts. God's word shows up as his affidavit, as his disposition, as, as his testimony. Although he's not physically there, his word is so powerful that the Bible says the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. His word is so powerful that he spake and it was done. He, he commanded, and it stood fast. I wish somebody here would understand the God we serve, the Jesus that we serve. He's in the Old Testament just by his word. His word is so powerful, he doesn't even need to physically be there. He'll just send his word. The Bible says he sent his word and he healed them. He just speaks the word. In the book of Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, a text, the text that you know, and ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Why? Because God has an affidavit word. <laughs> he doesn't have to actually be there. His word is enough. Will you turn to your neighbor and say, his word is enough. His word is enough. Uh, you can count on his word. His word is so powerful that it's enough. That's why Jesus says in John 5, 39, our scripture text today, he says, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. But you don't get eternal life in the scriptures. The scriptures testify of Jesus. Amen. Every T, every I that's dotted, every T that's crossed, Everything in the scriptures talk about Jesus, Old and New Testament. Hallelujah. And the theme of the Bible is Jesus. That's what it's all about. And I, mean, I need to make that clear because you don't, you're not saved by studying the Bible. You can study the Bible all your life and be lost. Am I right about it? You can read, you can memorize all the scriptures. You're not saved by Adventism. I know, I know it's going to get quiet here. Just because you're a seven-day Adventist doesn't get you in there. That's not what the text says. It says the scriptures testify of Jesus. You're not saved by living a life full of health reform. I think you should eat right and dress right and do, but that's not what saves you. The only way we're saved is by the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. When we look at Jesus, we see him as the one that saves us. He is the authentic intelligence. He's the AI of God. He's the one that is all together lovely. He's the one, he's my lighthouse. In the, no, in the darkness. He's shelter from the storm. He's my guide. Or oh, Rocky Mountains. He's my rest 
When I'm warm, he's my bread. When I'm hungry, when I'm thirsty, he's water too. Everything, I need him. He's got it all. I'm trying to tell you today that the authentic intelligence, the AI, is knowing Jesus. Every Bible study that you give, you ought to talk about Jesus. Every prophecy that you claim, every time you talk about the 2300 days, are the end of time or, or anything in Revelation. If Jesus is not in it, it ain't true. Amen. Every time you talk about the spirit of prophecy, if Jesus ain't in it, it ain't true. You got to put him in everything. He said, and if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. There's got to be something about Jesus in every doctrine that we teach. And if Jesus is not in the doctrine, it is a false doctrine. 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to this earth. Came to this earth because he had a mission. He had already been the Messianic Jesus. He, he'd already been the Theophany. He'd already given his disposition. Now he wanted to give a real life experience. He wanted to give an authentic intelligence. Not, not, not an intelligence that is, is um, uh, fake. Not, not a man-made intelligence, but authentic. The origin, his origin is real. Am I right about it? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And when we understand this authentic intelligence, then we're not fooled by the artificial intelligence. Let me tell you today, there's going to be a lot of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence says that you have to depend upon me to be saved. You have to depend upon my abilities. You have to depend upon my knowledge. You, artificial intelligence is human-based. It's based upon what man can do, what woman do, how we can fix things, how we can program things. But salvation is not based on man. Hallelujah. It's based on Jesus. And Jesus says, I, I'm the only one that has an authentic intelligence. So when you think of AI, think of authentic. The only authentic the one that there is is Jesus. Is he not authentic? Is he the only one of his kind? As, as John said in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. That only begotten says monogonase in Greek. It means the only one of its kind. The in vitro fertilization baby. <laughs> the only one of its kind that walked upon this land and never sinned. The only one of its kind that went through Gethsemane and went to Calvary and died for our sin. He is the authentic intelligence. Hallelujah. I got to stop today. I'm thankful that we have a God that is authentic. Are you glad he's authentic? He's, he's not artificial. He's not fake. He's real. I said he's real. He's a God that if we trust him, he will save us. And if we believe him, not only will he save us, but all those around us, he'll work on them too. Are you thankful that we have a God like that? A God that regardless of what we go through, he's always by our side. Today I'm going to invite you to stand with me to honor such a God. Just stand with me because you're thankful for what he's done in your life. Are you thankful? If you're in line today and and I want you to understand that today, wherever you are, God loves you just the way you are. Hallelujah. Maybe you're in some situation where you shouldn't be. Maybe you're in some bed where you shouldn't be in that bed. You could, be over, you could even be on lockdown, but God, he's right there with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Maybe you're, you're strung out. Maybe, maybe you are 
you, you're not as holy as some people in church. Maybe you're doing all sorts of types of things that we can't even talk about. But God still loves you just the way you are. Hallelujah. He wants to save you, whoever you are. He wants, he wants you to give him your life. Listen, even, here, even those that are here today, we all have some addictions. Amen? We all have some failures. And, and, and when Jesus comes by, he comes by sinners. Does anybody need him today? Does anybody need him today? I need him every day and every hour. Maybe somebody here in this place wants to accept him as their personal savior and be a baptized member of this church. This is your time. That's why we come here, because we want to give you the opportunity to say yes to God. And if you want to follow him all the way, if you want to be his disciple, whoever you are, and you want to be baptized, and give God your heart. My elders are here because we want to welcome you into a place of safety, a place of security, a place of peace, a place of joy, knowing the God we serve. He works with sinners, whoever you are. That's your decision today. I invite you to come down and say yes to God. Maybe you've been baptized and you want to follow you want, to, you want to start again with God? That's your decision. This is your time. God loves people that fall because he wants to bring you up again. Just men fall seven times and rises up again. This is your time. else today. Whoever you are, this is your turn. It's the last call, come on. Maybe you're watching, you can make a decision. Call us on the phone, send a text, whatever you like to do. Make this decision right now. Don't let this day pass without making a decision. Hallelujah. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we're children in heaven. We're thankful that you are right by our side. We're glad to know that Jesus is in all of the scriptures. Every text is filled with Jesus. Help us to know that you are the authentic intelligence. Before AI, you've already been here. You're from everlasting to everlasting. There's never been a time when you haven't been here. And you're willing to reach us and meet us right where we are. Thank you, God. Save your people. Save us, oh God, as only you can. Help us to know that you can search the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life. But the scriptures testify of Jesus. In your name we do thank you and praise you. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.